Good morning. We are so glad you're here at New Beginnings Community Church. Let's stand and worship our God today. How great is our God? Like, man, I, I can't even think of any funny things to say right now because I'm, I, I know how great our God is. It's been a tough week for some of us, and others are feeling good and bad, and all of that means nothing when we think about how great our God is. How great. He is the one that we go to through for everything. That doesn't mean I don't have announcements still, because I do. <laughs> That's right. Nothing changes. Um, you guys all have your Connect card if you're here. If you're at home, you're not going to have a Connect card, but we do mail it to you if you want. We can email it to you, but you can also connect with us using our Facebook Messenger app. And I know it's like a crazy world of social media, um, but this is a really good way of connecting with us. You just drop a message. Um, our administrator will get that and make sure that you get connected with the things you want. If you have any prayer requests, this is how you're going to get there. So I want to make sure that you guys are looking out for our Facebook page, our Facebook group. We have the cafe, but also check out our messenger and make sure you're getting connected because it's going into the holidays and we know that you guys really need to be connected to Jesus. So we want to help you do that and we're here for you. So just uh, check that out if you need to get in touch with us. But also um, you can go to our YouVersion Bible app to get a copy of the Connect card. Um, well, it's actually the, um, the bulletin, and that's going to have all of the message information and notes, and you can put your own notes in there as well. Just go to the event. Um, we do have one other announcement, and I just before we um, watch the video for Operation Christmas Child, we do still have some boxes out here available, but the turnaround is really quickly, so we need the boxes back 
next week already. So we've got to be able to get those sent out and mailed out to the kids, and we want to make sure you guys have an opportunity. So there is an Amazon. Um, it's kind of like a baby registry, but if you want to go that way and do your shopping, then it's all set up for you. Um, you can send everything through the Amazon app, and that will get um, to Crystal, and she'll make sure that you get the connection for Operation Christmas Child. So we have a little video. and Is this a long one where they should sit? Yes. You know what goes great <laughs> with a glass of milk? Packing an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. Okay, let's be honest. Packing an Operation Christmas Child shoebox can go great with anything. It's so that other kids can learn about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Oh, and it's also a great way to teach your own kids about giving. Teach your kids about giving. giving. Have a great day. Oh, and don't forget, make good choices. So basically, you get an empty box, which any box will work. Really? OK, not any box. Much better. OK, so now you have your empty box. Now you can pick the age range, and if you want it to be for a boy or a girl. OK, come on, please be a boy. Please be a boy? Well. Well, so we're going to be packing for a boy this year. First, you can choose a wow item, such as a soccer ball or a stuffed animal. Mm. And you can choose other fun toys, too. Hygiene items and school supplies. There are, of course, some items you cannot pack, like liquids, food, Items related to war, live animals. <laughs> no candy and no toothpaste. When your gift is finished, you can write a letter and include a photo. It gives it a nice personal touch. When your box is done, you can make your shipping donation online through Follow Your Box. Simply print off your tracking label to see where the destination of your gift will be. And don't forget, it's important to pray for the child that is receiving this gift. Because packing a box is a simple way to share the gospel with kids all around the world. Maybe even in... Mid... In Africa. Now that your box is done, it's time to get moving. Transport your box to a nearby drop-off location near you. Drop it off and voila, you pack the shoebox. Easy as one, two, three. Um, and feel free to clap through this song because it's one of those. Can you hear? There's a new song breaking out from the children. Sings a new song. Oh, yeah. New be 
Today's reading comes from James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it not forgetting what they have heard but doing it they will be blessed in what they do Jesus I just don't trust you you don't trust me no I mean I want to trust you I just don't <laughs> I have an exercise that I think will really help you. Oh, okay stand here and face this direction mm -hmm. now do you trust me uh, no, I just said I don't trust you. Right. Well, this is all part of the exercise. Oh, all right. Okay. Whenever I ask you if you trust me, you say, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Even though I don't. It's practice. Okay. So, do you trust me? Uh, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Are you going to catch me? Don't worry about that part. Okay, that's the part I'm worried about. <laughs> you can do this, okay? Just trust me. Trust you. Fall back. Okay, well... Jesus, 
I trust Good. you. <laughs> yeah. See, this is what I'm doing. I'm gonna fall. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay. let's try this again. Just face this direction and keep your feet planted. Okay. All right. Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Okay. I'm gonna do it. All right. I'm really gonna do it. <laughs> okay. Good. too close. You need to move back. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this one's a little bit different, Laura. Oh, okay. Uh, stand here. Uh-huh. But face me. Oh, forward fall. Okay. I can do that. Wait. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, wait for my signal. Oh, right. The Jesus signal. <laughs> yes. The okay. Jesus signal. Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus. I trust you so much. Good. Fall back. <laughs> That's awesome. It is awesome. <laughs> Especially when you do it. <laughs> Seriously? Of course. Okay, Jesus, I don't know if you noticed this, but there is nobody over there. I know it looks that way to you. It looks that way. It is that way. You can do this, Laura. Just trust me and fall back. <laughs> Jesus, I can't do that. We can do it together. I can't. You can. I won't. Well, good morning. This morning we, uh, we begin a brand new teaching series called I Quit. When we think of I Quit, we usually associate it with something like I quit my job or I quit a relationship or something like that. But in this particular series, what we're going to be talking about is quitting something that limits us, something that imprisons us, something that keeps us from being everything that we could be in Jesus. But Jesus really has a dream for our lives, but we quit those things that would limit our our lives dreams jesus dream for our life and and this <clears throat> this series is from open church and i'm really thankful as far as uh, they're sharing their resources but this particular message is uh, a message preached by a guy by the name of uh, matt keller the pastor at next level church he preached this this message about quitting making excuses to myself, as well as about 185 other pastors uh, from around the country, and, and he absolutely blew us away. To say the very least, and this is a warning for you, it's going to be powerful and it's going to be intense. Because this message is going to give you the power to change your life. Because what we're going to be talking about is the, the, the things. We're going to be trying to answer the question, why do we walk away from Jesus by making excuses over what we understand as our signature sin? And so just to try to give you an idea of what a signature sin is, is this. Signature sin is, is, is an ingrained habit, a bad habit, something that Jesus would not want you to have that has been so ingrained into your lifestyle, it actually has the ability to define who you are. There was a, a woman in the first church that I ever was involved with, uh, there was a woman who was a worry ward. She worried about everything, everything you could possibly imagine. And um, she finally got to the place where she got really sick and tired of worrying. So she went to the pastor and she talked to the pastor and then, because the pastor was a Pentecostal pastor, he cast this spirit of worry out of her. And I still remember her response to that. She said, it felt like I lost my best friend. It felt like I lost actually a part of me, a part of my persona. That's what a signature sin is in our life. Now, <clears throat> Solomon had a signature sin. In the Bible, King Solomon had a signature sin, and his sin was women. If you think about King Solomon's reign as a king, he really knocked it out of the park in the first 20 years of his life. 
In 1 Kings, in the book of 1 Kings, the first 10 chapters are devoted to King Solomon's successes. He just knocked it out of the park. He, he built the temple. He built a palace. He created this kingdom. He was building up this kingdom, not only governmentally, but religiously, of Israel, the people of God. That's what King Solomon did for the first 10 chapters. And then the 11th chapter comes, and there's a however involved with it. Let's read it. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. Solomon had crazy success in the first 20 years of his reign. But there was, however, asterisk on that success. What what I've seen is that the Bible, the scriptures tell us about our howevers. It actually describes five truths that I would like to describe for you about our howevers. Okay, so let's take a look at those five truths about our howevers. The first one is, Everyone's got a however. John the Apostle wrote, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. We all have our however. We all have our signature sin. We all have something that's gnawing upon us, keeping us from being everything that God wants us to be. Second truth, God warns us about our however. We can see it with Solomon. They were the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. So, just to give you a little bit of background on what's going on here, okay? In Deuteronomy, Moses anticipated that that Israel, the people of Israel, would want a king. And so he prescribed what the king needed to do. And one of the things the king needed to do was read the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. They need to be read continuously by the king in order for the king to come to understand how a righteous king would rule the kingdom of of Israel or the people of God. And so embedded in the five books of Moses, and in specific, Deuteronomy, it describes the idea that the Israelites cannot afford to go after foreign women because they will draw their hearts away from God. Solomon knew this because he read the five books of Moses. He read Deuteronomy. So he was warned about this. God warns us about our howevers. Third truth. If we don't submit, our however will capture our heart. Certainly was the case with Solomon. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. Dude had a thousand women. Just the sheer number really describes his infatuation. Perhaps the, the, the number of women that he had fulfilled the felt need. Maybe the intimacy was a stress reliever for him, or maybe the affection that they they held for him was an affirmation that he felt. Whatever it was, these women captured his heart. Solomon allowed his appetite to really define him. Now, I want to I make sure that you understand, not every sin d- defines us. We all have many sins that we, we make mistakes all the time. Not everyone defines us. It's those things that we create our life, those things that become a lifestyle that hold the capacity to define us. All right? That's number three. Number four. Our however will probably be a lifelong battle. Sure shooting was for Solomon. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. 
Women became an addiction to Solomon. Like any addiction, you crave and you love that more than anything else. That's number one. If by the grace of God you're able to stop this addiction, then you run into the next thing. You have to make a daily decision not to restart it. Those people who are are alcoholics who no longer drink are called recovering alcoholics because after they stopped drinking, they have to make a daily decision not to restart. It's a lifelong battle. And then five, if left alone, our however will compromise our dreams and legacy. And once again, we turn to Solomon. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you've not kept my covenant and decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. 20 years plus, Solomon built up this kingdom. He put his life into this thing. And it was going to get torn away from him and his descendants and given to a subordinate. Turned out to be Jeroboam, but Solomon didn't know. It was just torn away from him. So everything that Solomon had done, all his dreams, his whole legacy, dashed because he refused to deal with his however. If you, I, I need to try to describe this to you as far as spiritually speaking. If you think about it spiritually, this is actually a continuum. Let me try to describe it this way. On one side of the, the continuum, the spectrum, you have Jesus and the power of Jesus. And you lean into Jesus and you do and you follow the things that Jesus wants you to do. At the other end of the spectrum, you have either self will or self-deception that takes you down the path that yourself wants to go. And the deciding factor about whether you're going towards Jesus or away from Jesus is your desires. And it's not static. Your desires change every day, every moment. There's times when you get to the place where you go, I want to I lean into Jesus. I want to do what you want me to do. And so you go in this direction towards Jesus. But maybe then you get into the place where you go, man, this is too tough. This is too hard. And then you turn around and go your own direction because you think that that's a better direction, an easier direction. You can't deal with it. And you're going away from Jesus. And then you get to the place where you go, oh, no, 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 that, that can't be right. And that's what repentance is, Right? Repentance is just changing direction and going to Jesus. I have to, I have to let you know here, okay? I've got, I got to make an important point. Dealing with your signature sin is not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of leaning into Jesus, leaning into the power of Jesus, because it's only Jesus' power that can, can change you, that can bring you to the place where you need to be at, where he desires you to be at. It's not you sucking it up and trying harder. Please understand that. Jesus wants to help. He wants to help you in the worst way. But as our opening video described, If you're going to be following Jesus real closely, it takes a serious amount of faith because you're making a lot of decisions where you don't know exactly where you're going. When you decide to follow Jesus, you enter into what we understand is the threshold of the scary. The threshold of the scary is <clears throat> understanding what God wants you to do but being afraid to do it. Because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be traveling down into the <clears throat> valley of the shadow of death. Because something inside of you has to die. Something inside of you has to die. Remember 
the woman who lost her worry wart spirit, right? She said, it felt like some part of me is gone. It's been carved out. Something inside of you has to die. That makes it really scary. Because you don't know how to navigate life then. And you're completely disoriented and don't know exactly what to do. Other than follow Jesus. That's what following Jesus leads to the threshold of the scary. How do you know you're in it? How do you know you're in that particular place? Five, five signs that you could be in it. The first one, ironically enough, is pride. You know, we have this mad skill of being able to take pride in just about anything. Sometimes we take pride in delving into something really deep in our life. There are people who have taken pride in delving into, at least I have, have the, the courage to be able to deal with this. And so they take pride in that. Could be fear or insecurity. Some people would look at it and they go, I don't know what's the matter with myself. I don't know what, I, it seems like I was so strong before and I'm so weak right now. They're insecure about what's going on. They're fearful about what the future brings. Some overreact. When somebody calls them out, asks them, hey, you know, uh, I thought that you were doing this or that or the other thing. And they get, they, they just completely overreact, go off the wall, off the handle, and get really angry. It's usually defensiveness. Some people get judgmental. I'm dealing with this thing. Why can't you deal with this thing? And then some people just make excuses. I can't do this because fill in the blank. These are just the signs that you might be on the threshold of the scary. But when you're there, what do you do? What do you do? Well, this is what I offer to you. Embrace a season of brokenness. Embrace a season of brokenness. The lady who had the worry wart spirit, she thought it was an event. She was going to get this carved out of her. It was all going to be gone. It's a, se it's a season. It's not an event. It's a season. And you don't know exactly how long it's going to be. That's one of the scary parts about it. It's a three-phase season. Let me try to describe it to you as far as not only the, what you might be experiencing, but also looking at it from the idea we're about to enter into the winter season, right? Although, you know, it's sunshiny outside. It might be 70 degrees today. Beautiful day. Wait a couple of weeks. You'll start seeing some white stuff, right? We're starting to enter into the season of winter where it gets darker and darker. The first phase of the season of brokenness is conviction. That's when things start getting darker in your life, folks. Conviction comes when you start to understand, you know what? This is a problem. And you start to own the problem. But as you go deeper into that darkness, that season of brokenness, you come to the realization that that thing owns you. That thing has its cause in you and it's not giving you up. And it's exacting a toll on your life. Season of brokenness, first phase, conviction. Second phase, and this is the pit. This is about as dark as it comes. This is like January in wintertime, okay? The days are dark, it's really ugly because it's cold, there's a lot of snow, and everything is twice as hard. When I was in the nursery business, try to get anything started in January as far as equipment was concerned is hard. <laughs> and trying to do anything other than the minimal, what was easy in, the, in June was tough in January, twice as hard in January because you had to fight the elements and you had to fight the snow. In the season of brokenness, in the confession stage, second phase, is when you start confessing. You start owning it, okay? You already owned it, but now you got to start saying something about it. 
So first you go to God, and you confess to God, and you get forgiven, and there's encouragement in the forgiveness. Also, you, you go to God for the power. So God is wonderful as far as in one thing when you confess to God. There's a release, if you will, an encouragement. But perhaps God made it so that you can do the second phase as far as confession, confession is concerned, and that's confession to an accountability partner. You need to have somebody who's an accountability partner. This is the reason why. God places the power to do something. It's Jesus who has the power to change you, your situation and you. You don't have it in and of yourself. So an accountability partner isn't, are you sucking it up and trying harder? That's not what an accountability partner does. Remember, it's your desire to seek Jesus and lean into Jesus is the way in which you can make a difference. Have things change in your life. That's what an accountability partner does. Are you seeking Jesus? Are you seeking Jesus? Which way is the arrow going in your life? Are you moving away from Jesus? Or are you moving towards Jesus? That's hard. Because we know those who have been forgiven know that God is gracious. But that it's venturing out when you're talking to an accountability partner because it's been our experience that people are not quite so gracious sometimes, right? And so when you talk and become vulnerable to somebody, that can get scary. That second phase, confession. Third phase is consecration. Consecration means you're, you're set apart for the work of God. In this phase, as far as brokenness is concerned, you're starting, things are starting to, to brighten as far as you're in February and March. And you have just the beginnings of new birth. Things are starting to lighten up as far as the, the daylight is starting to get more and more. You're going in the right direction. And God gives you an understanding of why you had that pain. What was the purpose of that pain? So that you can help somebody else. That's what consecration is all about. Ministering to somebody else. Because those people who have gone through something already are those people who have much more credibility in the eyes of somebody who's going through that than anyone else. God doesn't want people to travel through that alone. Season of brokenness is necessary. It's essential if you're going to change. I told you it was intense. I told you it was powerful. If you embrace the season of brokenness and the difficulty and the length involved with it, there can be change. The question I have for you is, do you trust Jesus enough to cross over the threshold of the scary? Now, it's a heavy, it's been a heavy, heavy, heavy message. And it's not my favorite thing to try to place more burden on you and heaviness. But here's the, the good thing. Because everything that's heavy has another side of the coin. The other side of the coin in this particular thing is freedom. Because anytime you and God agree that you need to change, nothing can change it. Nothing can change that because God alone has the power to be able to define you as his child as opposed to having the sin define you. Your signature sin define who you are. And that's certainly what he wants to do. Next steps. Uh, found in your, your program. Um, you can find them uh, on the Facebook page of the church. You can find them uh, in the YouVersion Bible app. 
regarding the accountability partner. If you're online, what I want to do is I want to give you the opportunity to be able to ask, talk, get prayer, what have you, whatever you need. So private message, our Facebook page, and we'll make sure that we are in this p position where we can get you an accountability partner, somebody who will be with you, be in your corner, rather than just somebody who is, uh, is wondering what's the problem. So I hope you take this advantage. I know it's a tough one, but once again, freedom is riding on this. I'm telling you straight up, everybody's got a however. And you're probably thinking about it right now, what's your however? This is your opportunity to change that. I hope you take advantage of it. Give you a moment to consider it and think about it, then we'll pray it out. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. Thanks for delving into all of the junk that we carry. Got, all have got a lot of baggage. But I just, uh, I particularly thank you for what you're going to do in people's lives through this message. It's a heavy one, but boy, there's so much freedom in riding on this one. I just pray that people might just turn to you and enter into that scary zone and be changed so that they might become the people you desire. They might fulfill everything you have in, in store for them. Oh, Lord. Give us freedom, please. Give us the strength to go through that, that season of brokenness, that valley of scary, the threshold of scary, and, and on and upward to the other side of that valley where we have freedom and we have sunlight and we have the full knowledge of your power so we can help others. Help us to do that, please. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Working on my house the other day, and uh, it's a little 200-year-old house, so I'm clear tearing off the rot and everything, and there's more rot underneath. And then this has happened, that has happened, and actually, I wanted to quit. I got depressed, sat in the chair, and I wanted to give up. And uh, I could see that God was tearing apart me a little bit. And there's a little bit of crap. And the more that comes, there's more crap. And there's more crap. <laughs> I just want to forget about it and quit. You know, sometimes it gives me everything that I need. Yet I still complain that I don't have enough. Sometimes it gives me the answer right in my hands. But yet I don't want to take it. I don't want to curse him for everything I'm going through. But what I did, I picked my hammer back up. And I got back up, and I started back working again. And that's my choice. I don't know where you stand. 
I'm not going to judge you guys at all or anybody that's listening, but I know for me, I was trying to do it on my own, and I can't do that. Nobody can. As the pastor said, wow, what a message. I need God. I need Christ, that strength, or I will not make it. I need to be broken before him so I can turn to him. Samson was I'd make a prophet I know the longer I know the harder the walk will be with my Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Pastor John. Uh, Pastor John mentioned before we came out, this was going to be a, a, a tough, uh, tough message. And, and, it, and it was. It was good. I, I remember when I was a teacher, there were times when I would, <clears throat> I would present a lesson to my students, and I was so fired up about it, and I, and I knew they were with me and they were engaged, but I always worried that when they went home and went out to play, <clears throat> they would forget the value of, of, of what I had taught during the day. We, we can't allow that to happen. We can't allow to ourselves to forget what God laid on your heart this morning just because it's a sunny day. If God spoke to your heart this morning, if the Holy Spirit whispered in your ear for change, you must follow through with that. You must not let it go. Maybe you need to watch the message again this week. Maybe you need to deal, deal with God in some prayer. But there's change in the air, and it's change for the good and change for the, for the best, for the kingdom of God and for all of us. I don't want us 
to forget that. I don't ever want uh, Pastor John to, to, to shy away from preaching the truth of the Scripture, no matter how hard it is, right? So we want to encourage him with that. So before I let you go, I want to encourage you also with, with tithes and offerings. It's important. We have many ways to give. Um, we have mbcc.today. You can give online. Uh, there's text to tithe, which I use. You can mail it in. You can, there's boxes in the back. It's important that we support the church. It's important that we support the work of God. Um, and not, not because it's just something to do. You know, when I was a kid, my dad was a, was a chairman of the building committee, they called it back then. And every time they needed something done in the church, he would come up and, and, and say, well, we need, to, we need money for this. And people always gave. But I always thought as a kid, I'm not sure it's good that they give just because my dad said so. It's important that you give because God encourages you. I don't want you to give because Pastor Randy or Pastor Mark or Pastor Brad says you should. You give because God is moving your heart to do so. So I want to encourage you to give to the church and support us in all things. Thank you again for an awesome service. We'll see you all next week. God bless you. Have a great day.